conversation me and my mom were having yesterday it talks about Esther when they were taken to the treasure room to pick out anything that they could wear to be presented to the king and how all the other women they picked the things that they wanted to wear but Esther said what would please the king and there's something about that you know whatever reason you're here for whether it's because you're struggling, whether it's because you're having a good day, family, whatever it is, are you here first to please the king? Are you here first to please the king? Did you set your heart and your mind right to come to bring an offering first to the king? Did you come into the throne room of the Lord God Almighty this morning ready to to present yourself to the king not with what you wanted not with the desire on your heart not with your wants not with your needs not with your cries not with your joy your joyful sound nothing but was your first thought what can I bring that would please the king what can I give that would please the king what does the king want and need from me what does the king ask that I sacrifice that I offer that I lay down this morning in order to please the king I want you to think about that before we go into the song because this is our heart's cry is to be so deep into the king that everything about us and everything that we do is exactly what the king wanted. 
what the king needs from us as his bride. So right now, before we start, I just want you to surrender your morning. Surrender your praise, your worship. Surrender maybe the bad attitude you had when you woke up. Maybe you hit the alarm so many times that you're not awake yet. Surrender it and get right before the Lord. And say, King, I come for you. What would you ask of me this morning so that I may come before you and please you?
your voice. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Do better than that. Come on, let's give a big old shout. You're an overcomer because there was a great temptation this morning to stay in bed and cover our heads and enjoy the rain. But you said, no, Satan, I'm going to go get my blessing. So turn to your neighbor and say, you're an overcomer. But you probably forgot to brush your teeth. Amen. You may be seated. God's good. Amen. All righty. All righty. All righty. Uh, quickly, 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 quickly. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. On announcements, uh, uh, let's see. Baptism the, on May 21st. I mean, May 1st, 21st. May 1st. Uh, so, uh, uh, Judy, you probably need to be baptized again. Okay. We'll, hold, we'll hold her down as, until we get them all out. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, if you didn't come to the stirring uh, Friday night, you missed it. It was awesome. Uh, uh, it, it re- I mean, Jamie Light just, you know, I, we got a great worship team, and, and I love them, and, and we do wonders. But, you know, Ashley's, Ashley's sweet spot is war. It's, you know, the team just kind of roar. But imagine the, the breakthrough and breaking down walls and then coming back with Jamie Light behind that in, in the intimate place. That, ooh, that's just, that just, that's like awesome stuff right there. 
Uh, all right. Uh, okay, I digress. Uh, Destiny classes start tonight. We got a new one, right? Uh, refinement. Uh, what is that? Uh, do what? Watchman on the wall. Live parenting. Hey, if, if your kids are unruly, uh, you need to go to parenting class. If you don't know they're unruly, um, uh, see somebody in the, in the congregation. They'll let you know. All right? Yes. If anybody's in child care, those are continuing education credits. You can, uh, uh, that'll go to the stuff that you have to, uh, the schooling that you have to do each year, right? Okay. All right. And uh, what new class did we start this morning? We started Holy Spirit this morning. All right. Yes. Watchman. Now, I just want to encourage those who aren't not already taking the kingdom class to come to Watchman on the Wall because Rob... If I stood up, you'd be like, she's going to talk forever. Uh, and now I may. <laughs> no, um, uh, but Rob and I were talking this week about... Oh, God. <laughs> Y'all look so pretty and all your purple. I want to take a picture. I need to do a pano picture. Yeah. Will you do a panel picture? Good job. Uh. <laughs> it's going to take him forever. And he's going to be wobbly and they're going to be like little. Why is he not moving? Honey, you're doing it the wrong way. I'm going to take a pano picture while I do the announcements because I'm a woman and I can do more than one thing at one time. Woo! No, I'm going to talk and do it. <laughs> okay. I'm carrying. I can't defend myself. Just saying. I'm a good shot, too. No. He said yesterday, we're going to be out. And I was like, again? I'm like, you take more vacations than I have since I've been married. Must be nice to be blessed, huh? I am. Okay, so Rob is, well, the reason I, well, I was actually, no, what I was thinking about was I should have been staying in the center of the room and I wasn't. R Ricky, move your big face. Oh. <laughs> so, um. Rob came by. I've seen it all before. Just saying. You know, you have issues because you want to come here. I'm just saying. I know. I told him in class today, I was like, I, yesterday I was like, Lord, why do you give me so many hard-headed people? There are more hard-headed people in this congregation than is necessary, I believe. But Jesus said, well, you have an issue being hard-headed, so I have placed many hard-headed people in your life to cause you to be buffeted so that you can be nicer to me. So I was like, oh, okay. So anyways, so I said the nicer I get and the more, you know, easygoing I am, you're going to have to follow, I'm just saying. Yeah, I know. Anyways, Watchmen on the Wall. Rob came in my office today. We're talking about Watchmen. And anyways, with everything going on with Gatesville and everything, um, we, he was talking to me about some revelation he had for the gates and different things. And so I just encourage you, even if you've already taken it, to come. If you um, want to, there's, there is a, we do have to fight a spiritual battle. And I feel like this class is um, extremely important for this season right now. We, I mean, we talked the other day about a Kairos moment, that moment where everything's kind of coming together. And I believe that this class is a holy moment for us to come in and start understanding what it is for us to keep our positions and be in prayer and know what we you know. Remember, we're the gatekeepers, right? So um, I just want you to avail yourself to the knowledge and the class tonight. Watchmen will be in here in the sanctuary. Parenting class will be in room two next door at, um, at Fifth Street. And Kingdom is in the same place, okay? Awesome. What else we got? Um, 
youth start uh, Monday nights <coughs> at Jared and uh, Kimberly's. So you guys uh, drop your kids off and go have dinner alone and, and have fun. Amen. Mills of Grace on the 23rd. How, you need people? Need two people? All right. Get somebody to the volunteer. Uh, on, on the 30th, we're having um, the, we are getting connected with a, it's called FMCI, Federation of Ministers, something, something, something. Anyway, um, we are, are, are getting connected with them, and they have regional meetings, and they're gonna, the regional meeting is going to be here on, on Saturday the 30th. Uh, we're going to sell barbecue dinners to those that are here to help raise money for the missions trip. But we also will uh, take pre pre-orders, and on Sunday the 1st, you can then pick up those orders and take them home, and uh, it's a fundraiser to, to, uh, to help with sending the kids to Peru and to the jungle, and uh, we promise we'll bring them back, okay? Unless you pay us, and then we'll leave them. Um, how much is $15? $15 a plate. Uh, we're going to have a child's plate? No? Okay. Well, we'll get it. There we go. Well, well, if they only got one, see me, and I'll take care of you. Okay? All right. Uh, Amber is making some decals for our window, the, the clear decals. So this is going to be the same size as like the Kimmy sticker that we did with the, the softball, number 26. So we're going to be selling these for $12. She's donating all of her time and all of her supplies for it. But all of this goes to the Peru mission strip. And then she has some other ones that are they're $8, right? has like faith, hope, love with the, um, the ich, this, uh, fish on there. So she'll have those also. So we'll be selling these um, over here at the, um, the bar area over here. So... I guess just let me know whenever they're all finished and we'll do it. So, and they come off your window. They're not there forever. <laughs> oh, the children's paintball, uh, seven-year-old to 12-year-olds, I'm told. Uh, April 23rd, you need to register by the 20th online, please. And then the kids' picnic, that was already, that was Friday, right? Did y'all have fun? All right. Did you take pictures? Oh, we were playing. I got too busy. Well, that's good. All right. Is that it? Ushers, can you come forward? Let's bow our heads, please. Lord, you, Lord, you can come on up. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and we ask, Father, that... Um, First and foremost, that you would help us to put aside everything, uh, anything that's going on in our life, for this moment to put our whole and full attention to you. And, Father, that we would have an encounter today, that we would not leave here the same way we came. And Father, as, as you do that for us, we just ask that you help us to honor you with our, our first fruits and our offerings, and we just ask that you bless that. We ask that you cause every building, every ministry, and every venture to be paid off beforehand. We no longer have to build up for this one, but we will have, and we will build up for future, Father. And we just praise you and thank you. And Father, as we bring this offering to you. We just ask for you to pour out on us. Father, we love you, and we are thankful for all that you do. And all God's people said, make your checks out payable to the point. Y'all guys wait until uh, I'll give you the signal. Uh, you can go online to the community point and give online. And what else am I supposed to tell them? Is that it? Okay, y'all give Lori a hand. All right, well, this is kind of more than a nugget. Um, it's a prophetic word for our congregation and just as a seal to that so that you don't really understand and listen to it. Um, I actually received this a couple of weeks ago on a Wednesday night, and I brought it to James and Lorinda, and um, there was a lot going on in the service, and they kind of 
didn't tell me one way or the other. So, which was, you know, their way of saying, not now. And um, we let it rest. <laughs> and um, so when I was looking over notes and things, I had something that uh, was going to bring forth. And then I saw this, and I was like, ooh. Now, I really don't know what to do. And I was really torn between the two. And I was like, well, I told Lorinda. I was like, well, I could ask Lorinda what she says because, you know, it's my fallback. I'm not doing it on my own. But I was like, well, God, just for right now, I'm going to go with the other one. But I know that if you want me to bring it forth, then I'll bring it forth. And we were in Sunday school. And out of nowhere, um, we were talking about how I was going to do the nugget today. And she's like, man, I hope you bring forth that word. And I was like, okay. God's cool. When we ask. He gives us so, um, our, so pay attention. This is, I really believe, and she agrees to that this is a word for our house. So um, we were in worship, and Kirk was going off on the drums, doing one of his um, drum beats. And as he was doing that, I envisioned, vi- envisioned David dancing, and who's bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. And I want to just read through that right now. It says, Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Okay. So this is what God said, that this is us as a body, that we've had his presence, and we've been carrying it, but it's been a struggle because we have it, and we go a few paces, and we got to stop, and we have to sacrifice, and there's a battle, and then we still have his presence, and we go a few paces, and then we have to stop again, and it seems like we're not getting anywhere because we have to keep stopping, but we still have his presence with us, and he declared that night that we've entered into Jerusalem. And that we're in the place of the promise where he's been bringing us. And that now we're in the fullness of his presence. And that now our praise increases and the victory increases. And the, and the, the presence is where it needs to be. And, I, okay, hello. <laughs> we don't have to keep stopping. That now it's the flow and we're in his presence. And that it's been a battle. We've been in his presence, but now we've entered into the place. Thank you. Now we're getting there. Okay. That there's no more stopping. And then I was looking this up, and I was like, well, what does Jerusalem mean? Yeah. Jerusalem means peace. So all this time, we were taking it from where it wasn't supposed to be, and we had his presence, and we were carrying it. There was battles, and there was battles, and we'd go, and then there was a battle, and then we'd go, and there was a battle. He said, you've entered in. You're in the place of peace now. So we need to grab a hold of that and praise and worship and not care about what people are thinking who are looking at us, but grab a hold that we are in the place of peace where his presence is supposed to be. And now we've entered in, and it's time to praise him. Amen, amen. Oh, man, come on. Everybody stand up. Hey, uh, Robbie posted something on Facebook about, uh, about his intimate worship at home. And, and I, what she's just describing is that we have great encounters here, and then, yes, we have the battles, and I agree wholeheartedly. But... Uh, God's, what God's declaring is we're going to begin to take this presence that we feel, these encounters that we, that we have during the times of praise and worship, but that's going to overflow through the whole service, but then it also it's going to carry with us to, uh, to each home, to, e- to each place of work, and there's going to be a glory, and there's going to be a presence that is with you, and you're going to begin to see and operate and hear and know the Lord, that what He is speaking and what He's declaring, you will feel the presence, you will have people come drawn to you because the glory is upon you. Amen, amen, amen. Are y'all ready to get into the presence of the Lord this morning? Morning. Are you ready to have an encounter face to face, mouth to mouth? Huh? Are you? Come on, let's go. Everybody, come on up here. Dear Heavenly Father, please get the lights. 
Dear Heavenly Father, fill this place with your glory. Cause us to see you face to face today. Cause us to fall prostrate on the ground and worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen and amen.
God of strength and power. Yours alone now and forever. Love this world could never stop. There is no one like our God reaching down to touch the broken. Come on, yes. Mercy breaking through this moment. Yes. Faithful is the one who saves. Worthy is your name. Oh God, the glory is yours. The kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise. The glory is yours. The glory is
has come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise. The glory is yours. The glory is yours. Oh God, the glory is yours. The kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name.
exalted far above oh God come on let's exalt him
declare how much higher he is, how much wiser, how holy he is, how worthy he is. All is his. All of our love of his love, Father God, all of our love towards him. disengage. Just because the music stopped, don't disengage. Come on. Go back into it. Let's get back there. Come on. you're slipping up in, even that area that you're messing up in, we're saying, Lord, I want you to exalt over that. I want you to lead. I want you to have rule and reign over that. Father, I don't want to do this sin, but I need you to rule and reign. Help me to will to do and the power to do. And then exalt you, Father. We exalt you above all family, above all work, above all situations. We exalt you, Father. spoke to me Friday that there needs to be a breaking of the agreement that we have with things that the enemy has been trying to come against many of us with, that we've come to a place where we're in agreement with him and we're walking together with him now instead of believing that God is bigger. As we began to sing this, I just felt like the Lord said, you know, deliverance comes when you sing a heart song that magnifies him. When you sing a song that you, you are magnifying him and exalting him above the things that you know are wrong, the things that you don't know that are wrong, the things that you're agreeing with that you know the, that, the God, that the Father doesn't want you involved in, but you feel such a strong hold with those things. The Lord says, as you exalt me and magnify me, deliverance comes because you're breaking agreement with idols and lovers and the things that pull our affections away. It's not just words. When they come from a heart of faith, it says, I'll break the agreement that you have because you come into agreement with me. And two can only walk together if they agree. So God's saying, exalt me above your addiction. Exalt me above your sorrow. Exalt me above your loneliness. Exalt me above your sickness. Exalt me above and be delivered. Walk with him. Walk with him, not with the lies, the deceit. So let's magnify him again. You know, you don't got to scream to magnify. It's just with your eyes closed and a heart fully right now towards him. It's like, I don't just exalt you, Jesus, but I love you. And you're bigger than this. And I want to agree with you.
want, I, can't, I want, I want this walking around to stop. I want this. This is his time right now. Every voice, instrument stop. exalt you in the house, to exalt you in worship, to exalt you in praise, to exalt you in the word. And then as we leave and go through those doors in every action that we take, help us to exalt you in every area of our life. With all that we are, with all that we are, we exalt you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell them you love them, tell them you're glad that they're here today. I want you to hold on to hold on to what we just had and in this high and exalted place yield to Holy Spirit And ask him to open our ears. Open our eyes in his presence. And take in the majesty and the glory in which we stand. 
at this moment in time when heaven has touched earth. The word of the Lord, I believe, for today springs literally out of the message that was given by both of our pastors two weeks ago. We, when uh, Pastor Annette talked about the new wine and the wine skin and how that God <coughs> in the spiritual does not throw away the old wine skin, but he remakes it and regenerates it and renews it to hold the new wine. And then Pastor Ricky came and talked about that outpouring of the new wine in such a way to help us to understand issue of multiplicity or multiplication that comes because of the outpouring of the wine that God is bringing in this day. <clears throat> During that time, the Lord uh, brought back to mind uh, something that's been on my heart for, gosh, about a month. And I've been digging in the scriptures about vessels specifically one kind of vessel that I won't mention yet, but I will shortly. And then when we began to have unfold before us the issue of a vessel called a wineskin that was being reju rejuvenated, regenerated, remade in the spirit to hold something so precious that words really cannot explain and cannot describe This morning in this holy place, we can almost taste it. But in days to come, we will not only taste it. It'll be so much more than that. I want to drink it. But in truth, it's not going to be for me to drink, it's going to be for me to pour out it. And I think I may get a taste or two out of that pouring out. But honestly, the wine that I'm after will not be served until that day that I'm sitting at his table. Just like when he departed at the Last Supper with the guys, he said, No more will I drink this cup, drink, share this cup with you until the day that we're reunited. That's what he said basically so there is a cup of wine that's coming and it won't be from made from the puny earthly grape it will be nothing less than the distillation that comes out of the tree of life and you think the wine that we have now is heady I want to go back to the wedding of the Cana of Galilee for a moment and take a look at, at something about vessels. <clears throat> so look at John 2.6 for a moment. I didn't go back to the whole passage. We understand that he was there at the wedding and they ran short of wine and, and the mom, Mary, got involved and, and asked Jesus... Uh, told him the issue, and he, he made a statement. He said, woman, which is a respectful term, he said, woman, what does that got to do with me? And I, I want to speak at that for a moment in a, later, but sh she told the, all the servants, do what he says, wise counsel, because she knew who he was, right? Do what he says. That, you can't get a better word than that from somebody. And so they came and asked, what are, what are we going to do? And the scripture says, now there were set there six water pots of stone. Let me go back and unpack that in a minute. According to the manner of purification of the Jews, and they contained 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. 
I'm not going to go into what happened after that. Well, you already know the story more than likely that it, well, I saved the best line until why until last, you know. Usually you wait till everybody kind of gets the edge off <clears throat> and then you bring out the worst line so they won't notice as much. It probably won't care either by that time, but that's celebration, you know. But Jesus saved the best for last. He does that all the time. Restoration is always better than it was in the beginning. That's just the way it rolls. That's the way it works in the kingdom economy. I won't go there. That's a whole other message on its own. But to be honest, <clears throat> I want to I go back to something here. And in the presence of the Lord, I don't know if you do this or not. I've spoken of it before. But sometimes when I get curious <clears throat> and say, Lord, why did you record this? You don't waste words, so if it's in there and it's been preserved all of these eons until now, it's got to be important. Amen? Even the begots that are so boring to read through are important. So sometimes when I'm in the quiet place, I ask the Lord these questions, and not expecting that he'll tell me it immediately, but it's something on my mind, and I'll put it before the Lord, and in his timing, I'll trust that he will speak to those issues, and he does. <clears throat> Been listening to Damon Thompson some lately, and he spoke a lot of what I'm going to, I'm not going to preach his sermon by any stretch of the imagination, because uh, we don't have the time, but <laughs> the reality is that in, in one of the, uh, messages on this podcast from April 1st, or April 7th, excuse me, up to the Wilderness Society, uh, he said, he shared a vision that he had been in Israel in a place where there was a, a tunnel that held a, a river, a, a water tunnel, right under the temple. I'll talk about that more later. But in that, he had an encounter with God, and it was really unusual. The guy that was with him is really big. Apparently, he's 6'5", and probably, I don't know, 280, no, no fat. You know, it's a hefty guy. They were actually in the stream, and he said, some of it is up to waist high, and you're in this tunnel. And he said, the guy is claustrophobic. And he started freaking out, because he's in a tunnel, He's in water up to here, and he can't take it. Too confining. I'm, I'm, I need out. I need out. I need out right now. Well, Damon basically said, as soon as I realized what was happening, I grabbed him, which you got, you know, you got a panicking six foot five, three, three hundred pound gorilla, and you're going to grab him. Okay, he had to. He had no choice. He grabbed him, and as fast as he could, he made their way out of that place. And he said, I knew there was something prophetic about what was happening, but I, it didn't come to me. And so he's telling this story now on April 7th, and he said, it's been 18 years since that happened without me understanding what that was all about until about three days ago. You ever ask God a question and waited that long for an answer? What kind of stuff have you tucked away in your heart wondering about? Well, I've wondered about this part of the scriptures for a good while, talking about the wedding at Cana, and I knew it was important, and I asked God, and it's been a long time, and it dovetails, or like a jigsaw puzzle fits together, it, it links up with something that I have studied for years concerning David and Zion. And I did not understand the fullness of what, what was going on until last week. It's probably been 10 years that I've been asking about that. And it starts right here at the wedding of Cana. Now see, you have... Jesus, 
approximately 30 years old. Grew up in a godly home. It's God himself, the word made flesh and dwelling among us. That, that's who he is or was at that point. And he finds himself at this wedding and he's already been baptized by John the, Apost John the uh, Baptist. And then at that baptism, the scripture says that when he came up out of the water, the way the words are done in Greek, it was that's the end of that experience. That, that is over. But something else happened immediately. The heavens opened and a dove, or the spirit came down in the form of a dove and lit on him. That's the picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. After the baptism of Holy Spirit, it says that immediately he arose and the Spirit drove him into the wilderness where he was tested for 40 days. And he overcame. Let me ask you. This is God in the flesh. And he has to go to the wilderness to be tested. God has to be tested. Does that not twist your brain a little bit? And he told John the Baptist when he was kind of reticent or didn't want balking here, I'm the one that needs to be baptized you. I don't need to be baptizing you. I'm the one that needs it. And Jesus said, let, let it fulfill all righteousness. Let's do this to fulfill all righteousness. Because really what he was doing is giving us a pattern. This is how you do it. We lost the image at the garden. Thousands of years later, God came back to give us that image again and more. The power to take on that image and walk in it, operate in it. That's another sermon. Here's God. He gets baptized by Holy Spirit before he is tested and before he begins his ministry. At the time that he sat down at the, at the wedding at Cana of Galilee, he hadn't, he, hadn't done his, he hadn't started his ministry yet. And so we, they find in this situation, Mary comes and says, hey, they ran out of wine, you know, I think you could probably do something about this, Just paraphrasing here. You know what a sanctified imagination is? <laughs> sanctified means set of heart to be holy in itself, but also to serve the Lord in holiness. That's sanctification. And everyone that's born again is in here is sanctified. You're being sanctified, and you will be sanctified. It's a process that lasts from spiritual birth until we graduate. All right? So in this quiet place, I, when I ask the Lord these questions, I open myself up to him and, and whatever the Spirit wants to lead. And I let my imagination run with it a little bit. Knowing that I don't, don't want to mess up the word, I'm not going to violate the truth of the scriptures and, and take it someplace that doesn't really need to go because I'm very sensitive. I try to be very sensitive to the spirit where he won't, he gives me a short leash. I can't get that far off track. But there are some things sometimes when you try to visualize what was it like when he was there? If I were sitting there, what would I see? What would I taste? What would I smell? What would I hear? What would I feel? And so I want to invite you to come with me for a few minutes on a, I don't know what, even know what to call it, sanctified imagination trip or whatever. Here's God, and he, it's put before him, there's a need here, and he said, what's that got to do with me? And it sounds, in the scripture, he said that to his mom, but really I think he was asking the father, What's that got to do with me? My time hadn't come yet. I haven't started my ministry yet. And once it gets started, there's no stopping. 30 years, approximately, I've been preparing. God preparing? I've been preparing. I've been, I mean, at 12 years old, I was discussing deep things with the scribes and the Pharisees in the temple for three days and my parents lost me. 
and yet he learned obedience. He, he learned grace. He began to exhibit the God, godliness that, that he had in, as part of who he was. And suddenly now he's finding himself having been baptized, having been baptized by the Spirit. He, he, he understands that it's getting close. The time is getting close to begin to move out. And so when she came with this issue, I think he, he really had to check in and say, is this it? Is this when it starts? What is this to do with me? Am I supposed to move on this? He asked the Father. And we know that's the way it worked with him because he said later more plainly in Scripture, I don't do anything on my own initiative. I only do what I see the Father already doing. So he's sitting quietly, minding his own business, and suddenly it's put upon him, are you going to move? Are you going to act? Are you going to begin your ministry today? now and this hour doesn't say in the scripture that he checked in with the father but I just that's what he does that's the way he worked and so I believe when the father said yes to him <clears throat> his mother already knew it apparently or at least that's what she wanted to see <laughs> moms can do that to you too they know stuff and a lot of times they can egg you on before your time, but, at, you know, they're always there to help you remember or remind you, you know, what you're supposed to be. You know, wives can be that way, too. <laughs> now that I think of it. And I won't go there. Come to marriage class. <laughs> so I'm taking too long here, but I just, I want, it, I want you to get a feel for what it is to sit down and let your sanctified imagination run with things a little bit and consider what the scripture said in just a few words as if you were there and you could experience it for yourself all right so here is the son of god who it says in the scripture laid down his glory laid down his prerogatives laid down his rights to come and be born as a man fully god but fully man so he's in this wedding and the mom says, do whatever he says. And so he tells them, get some jars. These weren't just ordinary jars. They're not like mason jars or something, right? These are stone jars that hold about 30 gallons each. And there were six of them. And it says specifically in the scripture that it was, uh, those were there for a purpose uh, according to the manner of purification of the Jews. Okay? That's what they were there for. Purification ceremonies in a house or elsewhere is called a mikvah in the Jewish religion. I'm not here to, to teach you all about Jewish religion because I don't know enough anyway to do that. But mikvah is a purification bath. You can't even get into this bath unless you've cleansed yourself first. Because it's not about how clean you are, it's about how pure you are, or will be. Alright? So we're not talking about washing feet, or heads, or the rest of you. You do that first, and then you can go to the mikvah for purification. It's a spiritual thing. It, it's not a physical. You do it in the physical, but it's a spiritual thing. Kind of like taking communion, Right? It's not about the grape and the crackers. It's what they signify in heaven. And so when we do in the natural what we're instructed to do, we see it, we taste it, we smell it, we hear it, we, we, all of that, but it is making ripples in heaven. That's what a mikvah is supposed to do. And so because these, were, these uh, pictures were there for that purpose, and it even said specifically, these hold about 20 or 30 gallons each, okay? So you got, let's say 30 gallons. You got six stone pitchers. They hold 30 gallons each. That's 180 gallons, if my math is right. Amen? You know what the minimum is for a mikvah bath? 200 gallons. And so even with the six pitchers, there's not enough for those jars to do what's intended. Wow. 
Which makes me wonder, did they bring all the jars? Now, before this wedding, that's a perfect time. Before a wedding or before a childbirth, before, even before pregnancy, if you're wanting a child and things of that nature, that, this is when you go into purification mode and you do the mikvah ceremony. And you come out spiritually different. It's kind of like baptism. You're already changed before you go into baptism, but there's something about being immersed, and this, this purification bath is a total immersion. There's something about being immersed that does something in your spirit. Maybe it's just the obedience part where Jesus said, do this to fulfill all righteousness. That's what he told John the Baptist. Can you expect to go into that in an obedient heart and doing it even if you don't understand it and not be touched by God in some way it's impossible if you've ever been baptized and all you got was dunked you need to really step back and wonder what didn't happen so there could have been really more jars than just six because they were unprepared to do the mikvah if all they had was 180 gallons it took 200 minimum Makes me wonder if there was a seventh jar. Again, supernatural, sanctified, imagination. Lord, why didn't they get the seventh jar if there was one? Well, the reason was there was still water in it. Now remember, this is not in Scripture. I'm telling you what the Lord shared with me or some musings from the Lord. I'm not going to tell you to build a doctrine on this, okay? This is Rob in the closet. But what if there was a seventh jar vase and it, and it was not yet totally empty? If 30 times seven jars is 210, that's 10 gallons more than you really need for the minimum. And so they didn't want to take the purified water, which is very difficult to obtain. You have to go through a lot just to get the water that's fit to put in the mikvah. And they, instead of having thrown that out or pouring it out or excuse me, mingling in it with unpurified water, they left that jar and, and brought the six. What does six stand for? It's the number of man. And who was being put upon to do something? A man. Not just any man. The God-man, the one to show us the way, the how it should be done right. And after checking with the Father, he got those stone pitchers. Now, think about this. I, I used to own a 20-gallon aquarium, and if it came time to try to move that on the stand, there was no, I was going to have to get help because eight gallons of water times 20 gallons is 160 pounds without the glass aquarium in the stand. Okay, 30 gallons, that's 240 pounds of water without the stone jar. And think about the stone. I mean, if you throw a, a, a pot, okay, pottery pot, you, you can make it tall. You can make, you've seen pots this big probably, at least in pictures, maybe in your house. I don't know. I don't know what you really put in them, but they're there for decoration. But they're made out of clay. They don't hold water that good because it's porous. And if you tried to put poor, pure water in there, it wouldn't stay pure very long because there's junk in the pores of the clay that leach out into the water. That's why they couldn't use those kind of pottery things for the mikvah. It had to be pure. So you get stone. And so you got some little stonemason somewhere with his hammer and chisel, and he's thinking, I've got to make a 30-gallon container out of this slab of rock. And he doesn't have a water drill. He doesn't have any of the technology that we have today that can burn through a six-foot slab of marble in 30 seconds. There's nothing like that. What he's got is a hammer and chisel. And so he, got a, he has to start ham, ch you know, chunking out a little bit, chipping here and chipping there, and... I don't even think they could grind it out, okay? It's pretty much a stonemason had to do it with a hammer and chisel as far as I could tell. I couldn't find any commentaries 
or anything online that talked about the technology in that day. How would you make a pitcher that would hold 30 gallons? How thick would it need to be to be able to be carried around and bumped and hold 240 pounds without breaking? It was thick. Had to be. And so not just the 240 pounds of water, you might be picking up a 75, 80 pound block of vase or jar. You're not going to do it by yourself. Maybe not even with two guys. It might take three to get those six pots just and sat down. And then they had to fill them. If they were smart, they didn't fill them and then try to bring them in. Amen. Well, how tall were they? If, if I was a stonemason, I wouldn't be thinking of a, a pot this high. I can't chisel that deep. So it's probably a squatty kind of thing and bigger around to hold that much, 30 gallons, you know. And, and back then, you also had to have a cover for it. They probably didn't have it covered in this thing. But I'm taking a long time to help you understand. This is no small thing. So they bring it and they fill those pots to the brim. I didn't have to carry it in filled that way because I would have sloshed some out. So sitting there and you fill it up until the water, you know how water comes up to the very brim and even goes higher than the brim because of the tension on the surface of the water? That's, that's a picture here. It is so full, it's fuller than the capacity of that thing to hold. And yet it doesn't spill yet all right so you got the stage set right another question that i have for you lord when jesus turned the water into wine <coughs> six pots 30 30 gallons each did he have 180 gallons of new wine sitting in his house Think of what you could do with that. Sell it, you know. Like the lady that God did one time, uh, she had a, a wanted some oil. He told her to, the, the prophet told her to go get every vessel you can find, beg, borrow, steal, whatever it takes. Because the amount that you get is the amount you're going to get, right? You, you determine the capacity that you're fixing to have. That's kind of what reminds me of this right here brought six and there was about 180 gallons of water there when did it turn to wine when jesus said or did something he said now go and dip this you know and and take it to the the master of the feast right and i, I puzzled about that i said lord did this guy have 180 gallons or, or or so of wine stuck in his house and it was toward the end of the feast right so maybe they didn't drink it all and he had maybe 100 gallons left or 120 gallons left after that's that's cool What was the deal? And the Lord did something weird. It's like, <clears throat> you know, when you ask the Lord a question and he brings something to your mind that has nothing to do with what you just asked. Nothing. Has that ever happened to you? Happens a lot in prayer, too. The Lord, I asked this question again of the Lord, and all of a sudden I got my mind's eye flashed, and, and it went to the, the scriptures that talk about the blind guy that Jesus healed by spitting on the ground and making mud and putting it on his eye and told him you have to now go to the to was it the gate wasn't the gate beautiful where was it Salon, Salon or Sychar Salon's Salon's pool Salon means scent so he was sent to the scent place to wash and regain his sight there's a whole message in there that I can't go into I can't go there, Lord, and he knows it, so i, I got to maintain here. All right. He, he took me to that place, and he said, so God spoke to him, right? He asked, what do you want? He said, oh, Lord, that I could receive my sight. So what, when did he get his sight? What if on the way, I mean, here's a blind guy. He's got an eye problem anyway, and now he's got dirt in his eyes. 
and he has to make his way through crowded streets to find this place. He knows where it is. He knows how many steps and which turns and all this. He's been there before. But it's irritating. And he has to go there and wash, and it's, it's a long way, and it's a hassle, and I'm already irritated. I don't need more irritation, Lord. But at your word, I will obey. Kind of like Peter. I worked all night. I'm a pro. I know how to do this. You're a carpenter, and you're going to tell me how to fish? Nevertheless, by your word, I will let down the nets. He took me to another time, too, in the scripture where in the Old Testament, it wasn't just New Testament, Old Testament. Remember when the Syrian commander, Naaman, I think it was his name, wanted to be healed of his leprosy. And this little Jewish slave, basically, who was captured, testified of the prophet that lived in Israel, and he could do something about this. You could find your healing if you're willing to go. And he said, well, I've tried everything else. I might as well, you know, so... He comes, right, and he gets to the, to the house, really, or the place where the prophet was staying, and the prophet doesn't even get up and come out. It, he sends his servant out. What do you want? Well, I heard about this prophet. Yep. Right in there. Well, I, I want to be healed of my leprosy. Really? Well, I'll go tell him. And he's thinking, why didn't he come out and find out for himself? He won't even show me the respect that I deserve. There's a pride issue here, right? You think you're going to get anything from God with that kind of attitude? Well, he did, apparently, because it hacked him off. And so you know the story. The servant comes out and tells him, here's what you do. You go down to the River Jordan, which was nasty compared to some of the rivers that he could have done at home. It's like, I had to come all this way to bathe in your nasty river when I could have done it, you know. Dip seven times the number of completion and perfection. Because of his pride, he was, he was ticked off. He, he said, I ain't doing it. I'm not doing this. It's stupid. And a little innocent, I mean, little right-thinking Jewish girl says, wait a minute, wait a minute. If he'd asked you to go do something huge like slay a dragon or, you know, climb, climb Mount Everest or wouldn't you, as courageous and powerful as you are, wouldn't you have done that great and mighty thing in obedience to what he said? Why can't you just do something so simple? So he humbled himself and went and washed his leprosy he was made clean. Now, Lord, what, is this, what has this got to do with stone jars and purification? And water that was drawn, but wine came out. And he told me, you asked me that question, when, when did I turn the water to wine? It wasn't when they filled it up and they brought them before me, and there, there they were. And I told them to do something. What, did, what were they told to do? Draw some out and go give it to the master of the feast. And so they go with a dipper or something. They dip some of the water that's at the brim carefully and they pour it into a glass or a goblet of some kind so that when they take it to him, he can taste the wine. Now, at what point was it wine when they stuck the ladle in? I don't think so. It's when they had fulfilled obedience to his command. And so when they poured out of that ladle into the cup, they drew out water. And I would have loved to get close enough to see the water coming out of the ladle clear and turning red by the time it hit the goblet. And so after the celebration is all over and he only used one jar full of he had five jars left of wine, right? No. It was five jars of water. Because <laughs> the miracle took place at the point of obedience.
stone jars. A lot of work to make them. But they're impervious if you get the right kind of stone. These were impervious to filth, impervious to that those things which corrupt would corrupt the pure the pure water that was needed to do this bath, the bath of purification. They had a ceremony all of its own just to cleanse the bath, the mikvah bath that you would descend into and duck your head down and be totally immersed in pure water to become purified. But these jars were made of stone because it had a quality about them that was able to refute and rebuke the bacteria, the dirt, the stuff of this world that would cause that water to become tainted. wasn't easy to get that either. It took a lot of work to make those, and, and it was probably costly to buy them. See, the retention of the purity of the water is really what that purification is all about. Because even the, the, you know how the Pharisees, they were so strict. They said they would even tithe their, their herbs. <laughs> Just to show how strict and how literal that they took the law, the word of God. And yet they were so busy doing the business of it, they overlooked the more weighty things like mercy and compassion generosity, humility, all of those things, that that's what they, that was what that's for. But they got so busy with stuff, they, they would overlook that. It's the same thing here. Even with a vessel that's totally impervious, at least for a season, the only place it wasn't impervious was at the top. Amen? Because it's exposed to the air. It's not hermetically sealed or anything. And it's... Uh, you don't put the lid on stuff can get in it and that, and then it'll spoil then you know you come back three weeks later and you've got a chemistry or, or bio, biology project right it's green and it's crawly and it's got all this stuff they didn't ever do that in fact the reason i brought up pharisees they said it was illegal even to to keep the purification water in a jar couldn't do it had to be living water had to be the water that comes right out of a fountain pure what are you going to carry that water with I mean, there's a place where our exactness breaks down. You can't do it. It's physically impossible to fulfill what you're putting on me as a command. And God never meant it to be that way. So these people didn't, didn't hold that kind of tradition. But basically what it is, they had these there for a purpose of purification. And it was probably to use them before the wedding ceremony, okay? Now, when... There's an alarm. When that wine was made, then then everybody everybody thought, wow, this is cool wine. But they weren't they weren't aware of what had just happened. They were not aware of what just happened. The only people that knew what had just happened were the servants who had to do, do the legwork. They knew I did not put wine in that jar. And so the lowlies saw a miracle. And the most important people, the, the guests who were invited, they didn't know, but it sure is good wine. They got the blessing, but it, how much more blessing would it have been if, you, if they could have seen what it took? Amen? That's kind of like us, right? All right, that's, that's one kind of vessel. There's another vessel that has to do with water. They're called cisterns. Now, a cistern is a nothing more than really a hole in the ground or a pit that you dig, but you do it in rocky soil so that when you dig down deep enough, you, you're maybe on a, on a limestone, probably not limestone. It's got to be something harder than that, like granite, or I don't know what, I'm not that much of a geologist, but you keep digging and digging until you can't dig anymore because it's all rock. Now you've got a cistern. In fact, they sometimes line the walls with rock and try to kind of seal it somehow so that when it does fill up with water, it'll stay pure for a while or drinkable, okay? Won't stay drinkable forever, though. Sometimes they would take 
pots or pottery or something and have them glazed in such a way to where they would make a good liner, but it wasn't meant to be permanent. It wasn't meant to last very long because it's open and it's in the ground. It's, gonna, it's not, you know, when you have a big rain, the water that they put in there was runoff. If you had a cistern at your house, which was likely, there's scripture that talks about that. Drink water from your own cistern. And that's more than just talking about water. It's talking about your, how, what you do, right? But if you had that cistern at your house, what you were catching in that basin wasn't just the rain. It was a runoff from your roof and maybe from your rocky pathway up to your front door and whatever else that could go in there. You had to let it settle. You ever caught rainwater before in a wash pan or number two wash tub or something? You got to let it sit a while because there's dirt, dust and dirt has to settle out. Then you can gingerly scoop the water off of the surface without stirring up what's in there. But don't keep it more than a couple of days. That's a cistern. Cisterns are, are needed over there because it's hot in the summer. And when, if you ever get a rain shower and there's not a well close to you, it's important to have a cistern, but you can't use them very long because the water's going to go bad. Or every cistern isn't totally watertight. It's going to drain into the dirt that's underneath because it's not sealed. Okay? Jesus... Uh, doesn't talk about cisterns, but one of the prophets did, Jeremiah. I'd like, if we could, look at that, uh, that scripture. I've, I've gotten way off, kind of, but uh, there are places that cisterns are used and, and the, what, what they were for and all that I can't, I'm not going to go into. But basically, in Jeremiah 2, I, there was a whole passage, but there's not time to look at it. So I'm going to start in verse 4 and 5, and then skip to 13, okay? Here's what Jeremiah said to the nation of Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord. Now, when the prophet says that, the next thing you hear is not going to be his words, right? He gave a whole list of a litany, if you will, of all of the, the leadership in the nation of Israel who had basically forsaken God and gone their own way. But he summed it up in verse 13. In 13, Jeremiah 2, 13, it says, this is God speaking, for my people have committed two evils. Number one, they have forsaken me. And number two, they have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Why is that a big deal? So I've got a busted cistern. He's not talking about earthly cisterns. He's talking about reservoirs of water. And even in our lives, we take a cistern that we build for ourselves, and we don't let just anything go in there. I'm, as much as I love you, Lord, you can't, can't go in some of the places that I have in my heart. And so I'm going to hold your word captive to this area and this deep and I, I love it when it's full because I can sip out of it and it tastes sweet I love your word that much to, to know when I'm getting refreshed and stuff but the real issue is that the water level goes down every time I, I do that and sometimes I have to get a another filling right to fill back up the cistern well the problem is if it's a broken cistern you don't have that long to use that water and it's probably not as pure because if you got a crack open to the ground it's not just the water going out it's what's coming in too and so spiritually speaking it says you've hewn for yourself a broken cistern that can't hold any water and how do you expect to survive without any water I would ask you that question this morning do you use cisterns in your life I'm not talking about natural cisterns. I'm talking about the drink of water that you want to have today to slake a thirst that you have that that water was drawn yesterday and already drank. How can that water slake your thirst for today? 
Or you find yourself in a tight spot and you go to the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, and you call upon his name and nothing happens. He doesn't come and meet you. But you remember way back, like 10, 15 years ago, similar situation, and here's what God said and did to relieve you, alleviate the issues and, and make you, you know, good. And so you're going back to that place to try to get the water to fix for today, and you can't. reason is it's not the way it works in the spiritual realm right one baptism many feelings it's a it's a relationship thing it's something that has to happen every day if i need a drink of water today which i will i have to make sure that the water is being replenished else i won't have anything if it's you know you hear me so broken cisterns are not the way to go. Even regular system cisterns aren't, okay? Something's better than that. Instead of making your own cistern, your size, your shape, your volume, why not go to a well? A well's good. In John 4, 7 through 15, there was a woman of Samaria that came out to draw water, and Jesus was there. The guys he had sent into town to find food, right? So he's got a one-on-one -on -one here. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said, if you knew the gift of God and who, who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, wait, we're at a well here. Right? Living water is running water. Is a well running? Not visibly. Okay? The woman said to him, Sir, you don't even have anything to draw with. What, where are you going to get this, this uh, water from this well? Now, it's interesting in the Greek, Jesus is talking about a well that uses a word called gebe. Gebe, it's a well. She says, you have nothing to draw with, and the well, she didn't use the same word, she used freyar, which is a word for cistern. It's deep. Where then are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this cistern? And drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock. Well, guess what? From Samaria, she didn't know a whole lot of the truth because they were way off in their theology. She didn't even understand that what she's drawing water from every day is not a freyar. It's a gay bay. And down somewhere underground, there is a spring that feeds this well. And that's called living water. But in her mind, she was just looking for something out of a cistern, a catch. And he was trying to even raise her above the natural and say, if you even knew who I was, who I, I can open the fount of living water in you. Wells are good. What he had to say was enough. It got her, got her interest. And she said, give me this water that I, I may not thirst and I won't have to come back to this place again to draw water. It wasn't her favorite place to be. There's, that's another story. You know what's better than a cistern is a well. You know what's better than a well? A river. That's where you want to be. Because a river is living water. And it doesn't stop being living water. Even when the river's low, it's still flowing. Look at First Chronicles 11, 4 through 7. I'm talking about David now. This is, I wanted to get back to this issue of Zion. You know, in the scriptures, let me, let me just give you a tip, okay? I, I can tell you later sometime if you're interested in finding out how I built this idea, because it's right out of scripture. 
When you see Zion listed in the scriptures, don't think of it as a little hill in, in Jerusalem. Okay? Don't think of it as that. Because prophetically, Zion was the unveiled glory of the presence of God that everyone could see. Not everybody could go there, but everyone could see. There were places in the town when they could look, maybe duck out from behind the corner of a building and get the tree out of the way, and they could see the glow of the Shekinah on the top of the hill. They got to see the glory of God. It was open. It was in a tabernacle that David set up with open sides. David used to sit before it. And he wrote about how safe it is in the shadow of the Almighty. Things of that nature, okay? When you think of Zion, when you read of Zion, think prophetically, this is my home. And I don't expect that I'm going to move to Israel. But I am going to be in the presence of God with, with the glory all around me. It's called Zion. Zion became more than just a hill. It became the name, finally, of the whole mountain, and then finally, the whole city of Jerusalem. They called, they called it Zion. But in truth, when you see it, it speaks of the open presence and glory of God that's manifest and visible. Okay? So here, King David. Let me tell you, we won't read. King David wanted to, it's, this is part of Naaman's message, it's too long to talk about, but he wanted to take the, the top of that mountain, it wasn't even called Jerusalem at that point, it, wasn't even, it was Jebus or Jabus from the guy's name, and the, the people that lived there were Jebusites, right? They had an illegal, they had an illegal association with one of the, one of the tribes and had forced them out, and they themselves were now masters of that place. Well, David wanted in that association because they'd taken advantage of one of the tribes of Israel. So he took, went up and took it. But th the problem was he couldn't go just up the hill. I mean, if you're, if you're military-minded at all, without airplanes, it's hard to take a high hill when you're wide open. I mean, they'll, they'll cut you down before you can get very far up that road, right? So David looked, found out that there was a tunnel there was a tunnel, and inside that tunnel, there was a river. That's how the tunnel came to be, because the river flowed, and it, it made a tunnel. They figured out where it was, and they sent their army up the tunnel into the fortified top of that mountain. They spilled out of that place probably like fire ants coming out, and they conquered the Jebusites and took that place and renamed it at that point the city of David. And then they took those walls that were almost impenetrable and made them even stronger. And that's where David's house was. He did this before the nation was even together. He was, it was still a possibility that it would be a split kingdom. But how did he get there? How did he win that victory that was unwinnable? Relied on a, on a river. John 7, 37 through 39. Jesus talked just not long after the woman at the well where he talked about giving her a drink out of a well that, that would give her uh, satisfaction where she would never thirst again. He, he said the same thing at uh, the last day of the feast in Jerusalem. Uh, he stood up in the middle of that party and he said, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow wells, cisterns, rivers of living water. And he spoke of this concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. It was on Jesus' mind to move past the cisterns. Don't even think about the wells. We're going straight for the river because he knew a river from its origin. The scriptures talk about that river that comes out of the house of God 
under the doors. And when you're standing up close in Ezekiel, it's only ankle deep, but you measure out a thousand cubits, which is 1,500 feet, and suddenly it's knee deep. You go another 1,500 feet, it's waist deep. You go beyond that, and you, your feet don't touch bottom anymore. You've got to swim. It's the river of God. Now, what's in, this, what's in the temple? Ark of Covenant. What is that? That's the presence of God to any Jew. That, that is the presence of God. God on his throne. You go to Revelation and you find out that the river of God comes out from under the throne of God. <laughs> and it flows and along its banks are trees called trees of life. And it says that they produce the fruit that's going to make that cup of wine that I share with Jesus someday. Fruit from the tree of life in every season. There is not a time when it's not ready, not available. And along that river, as it flows out of heaven, and it comes down to earth, this is the river that Jesus is talking about flowing out of you. The river does not run out. The way he said it to the woman at the well, it springs up, the word that he uses there, it jumps out of the ground and bursts forth into everlasting life. The thing about that river, it's mobile. <laughs> Since it's in you, wherever you go, you ought to be splashing on everybody else. That same living water, the, the water of life, of eternal life. Clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the street in the middle of the street and into the, into the countryside, leaves of the trees along along the side, the fruits are yield, yielded all the time, every month. The leaves of the trees are for the healing of nations. This is the river that we live in, and it's not... something I take for granted. Because I'm willing not to get a drink every day. Now I'm going to ask you a real, I don't want you to answer. Too many of us anyway. Are there days in the week that you never even talk to Jesus until maybe lunchtime when you ask a quick blessing on the food? Got up too late for a quiet time. It's been happening more and more that way. Or maybe you didn't even have time at lunch. It was a business lunch and you didn't want to take a moment to bow your head, you know, because they don't do that, the people that I'm at work with. And so by the end of your day when you fall into bed and you say, you know, I really need to pray. And so you said, dear Lord, and then boom, another day. No living water. It's there. Or how many times did you have an opportunity to dip into the container and hand living water to someone else? But you didn't. Maybe you were intimidated. Maybe you were just flat scared. Let me tell you about reservoirs. When a river fills a vessel, a reservoir, and you, he fills it to the full, even to the point of almost overflowing, <clears throat> it's like those stone jars. Because the idea of that river is to make you impervious to impurity. To where that water is in there. It's continually being refreshed, but even so, there's, no, there's nothing in this vessel that will cause it to become polluted. That's the intent. Now, we all, I know we're not all perfect, but God's working on me as much as anyone else. And so I can't claim that, but that's God's ideal, and that's where he, where he wants to go, okay? 
Now, the idea is that no matter where I go, where I'm sent, or where even if I go on my own, but I find myself in a certain place and suddenly there's a requirement for me to share some of this water that's in me, do I need to stop and have five minutes of prayer saying, Lord, give me a breakthrough here, give, give me a download? No. When these two excellent pastors come up, they might have spent all day on Saturday with Jesus, but the reality is when he downloads to them, all he's doing is clarifying what's already in there. He might, they might get some new information. I like nuggets. We all like nuggets. Thank you for your nugget. It was good. Prophetic. But the reality is the new wine is going to come from something that's already in the vessel. But if you're not replenishing it, if it's down to half and it's six days old, it probably starting to stink already anyway. And you're not operating in the river, you're operating in a cistern. Open the gates. We sing about it. Open the floodgates. What kind of floodgates are we talking about? The flood of the river of God that wants to come and energize us. Make us to be who we already are according to what the word of God says. Cause you to walk through your world spilling life out on everybody. And we think we look at the storybook, right? Apostle Peter walking down the street, shadow falls on somebody and they're healed because of shadow. All he was doing was wading in the river. He was full. God was operating out of what was already in him. The Holy Spirit comes to dip out of him to bring life to someone or healing or to someone or deliverance to someone or even just the words of God that are already in you to give someone hope where there hasn't been hope for decades. Rivers are way better than cisterns. They're better than wells. Every well that's a true well is connected to a river. If it's just a little river, we'll call it a spring. But it's flowing water. It's living water. And that's the way God works. Why not get in the best river? The only river that's going to bring life. The one that comes from under God's throne. And don't just visit it. Stay in it. Psalm 1, I won't go there, but Psalm 1 is probably my favorite psalm. Because it talks about a tree that's planted near a river. It talks about the fact that uh, the leaves never wither. And there's fruit in all seasons. Kind of like the tree of life that it talks about in Revelation. It's got deep roots, so it's strong. Every wind that comes along isn't going to destroy it or knock it down. It can withstand the elements. It can withstand the forces that come against it because it's planted next to a life-giving stream of living water. Lord, have mercy. That's who I want to be. An oak of righteousness. A planting of the Lord to bring him glory. And experience that glory as in his presence. Amen. When we are now walking in this time of new wine, I think it behooves us to pay attention to the fact that the new wine that comes out of you is going to be dipped out of the reservoir that you hold. And as you hold it, it's just living water, and that's good. That's life giving. That would be enough. But God wants so much more than that. Because he wants a celebration. He didn't want just the life. He wants a celebration of life. And so he's going to dip that water. And when he pours it out, it won't be water anymore. It will be new wine. And it happens at the point where we obey what he says. So I'd like you to stand.
bow your heads with me. I'm just going to say a short prayer and give it to Pastor. Father, energize us to want living water more than we want what we keep in our cisterns. We keep it there because we like it, but it can't satisfy. We keep it there because it's attractive to us, probably not anyone else. And yet, Lord, it's the very thing that the enemy uses to bring us down, to cause us to walk in confusion and walk uh, to sail <laughs> like a ship with no rudder, going in circles. Grant us, Lord, a heart that's hungry for, new, for you more than we're hungry for what we, we try to pack away in an impure vessel, a stinking cistern that's crawling with vermin and things that want to take our life. And don't let us sell, settle for a fresh well that we find online in a podcast where we can go and get a drink once a week. Don't let us settle for that. Get re-energized, and then the next day it's back to usual. Lord, cause us to bear down and not waste the time that we have in this age where the new wine is being produced and being poured out. God, give us the grace to stand up, the power to stand up and take hold of what you're offering us today. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Andrew, can you get the lights, please? Just the front two. I want you to, uh, we're going to show you a little video to celebrate our Kimmy. But first I want to say something. I want you to walk away from here today. You can be seated. I want you to walk away from here today. Uh, please give me two seconds, your full attention. There was a very powerful word delivered to you today. And not only is it a, an encouragement, it's a warning. It's also a, a, a teaching, a process that God wants you to grab hold of. The pot's got to be right or it's going to influence the water. The surroundings around the pot have to be kept out or it's going to influence the water. What you can get and dip out of that living water can only last but a day. It's today's word. You can't last on today's word two weeks from, tomorrow, from today. You have to go to the living water to dip and fill, up your, your, fill you up the pot. But it's not to fill up to hold on to. It's to fill up to pour out. And lastly, the water that you get filled up with, the reason why when you pour it out, it becomes wine is because whether you get a dollar or you get a million dollars, just for my analogy, when wine is added to the water, the living, the living word, which gives you the thing that you need, the dollar or the million dollars, when you have wine and you are intoxicated with that wine, you are enjoying the dollar or the million dollars because it doesn't matter to you because you're influenced by what you have taken in. That's good word right there. See, see, it, that's why you can go into a prison and sing praises unto the king because you're not full of water, you're full of wine. That's why you can get the promise and the desire that you want and, and, and it fulfill the answer of God and you can celebrate because you're full of wine. God is speaking very strongly to this body. And I pray with all my heart that you receive it. Come on in, kids. Let's go. Come on down up front. And I suggest, I wanted to call, have an altar call, but we're not going to. I want you to have an altar call with God yourself. I want you to go home and have an altar call with him. And say, Lord, I need you to fix my pot. I need you to fix my surroundings. I need you to help me dip into living water, tap into the living water instead of this stagnant water that I have been. And Father, as I'm obedient, dip out of me. And let me pour wine into others. Amen? Amen? All right. Are you ready, Miss? Where's she at? Miss Amy? Oh. 
You know, switched. Miss Sherry, you got it? You ready? Okay, okay, let's turn the back light off too. Travis White, right by you. All right, here we go.
think in light of the message we received today, which was awesome, and just celebrating Kimmy's birthday today, that one, she learned how to pour out. She learned how to let Jesus fill her up and and be poured out of. So I would just challenge you to put the word of God today into action. And if you want to do anything for her ministry that's still continuing in heaven, is go tell somebody about Jesus. When they ask you about your shirt, you tell them what Jesus did. And I'd ask you to pray for India today. She loved those kids in India. I was telling Ricky, I was going through her Instagram stuff, Instagram stuff yesterday, and she was like, I'm staying here forever. I'm not coming home <laughs> because she loved it. She fell in love with it. So I'd ask you to pray for India and bless the nation and uh, go share Jesus with somebody. It's not a boo-hoo thing. She's in heaven. She, they're having a party, and I'm pretty jealous, actually. Um, but let's, let's be the wine in our community. Let's tell them about Jesus. Amen. We love you. Y'all good? Yeah. I know. So I know. It's, I know. It's, it is. I know. We, our hearts hurt. But she's in our future. Her, she's having cake with Brianna probably. And that's totally. We're having cake too. So. Okay. <laughs> so we will see you tonight at 630. Remember Watchmen on the Wall is going to be in here. Kingdom and Parenting are going to be over there. And so we'll see you guys tonight. We love you. And uh, we'll. Huh? We didn't have you by sign up for marriage, so unless you sign up before 2 o'clock, there'll be no marriage class. Amen. <laughs> All right. We love you. We'll see you tonight.